Thank you, everyone. Um, it's great to be here in person. It's been a while since we've been able to see people face to face, and I'm excited to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about radiation and its role in prostate cancer. But to start off with, I wanted to talk a little bit about radiation and its history of use in medicine as a whole. And this started with a German physicist, uh, Rentgen, who discovered x-rays using cathode ray tubes, which would later be known as x-ray tubes. And that's him on the right and the top of the picture. And the first x-ray he took was actually his wife's hand underneath there. And pretty soon after x-rays were discovered for diagnostic purposes, people looked at using it for treatment of cancer. So Emil Grubb was a medical student at Hahnemann and also working with these cathode ray tubes, found skin reddening related to these tubes and theorized it could be used to treat cancer. Um, by uh, 1996, they had discovered naturally occurring radiation and actually um, Henry Baccarel and Madame Curie and her husband Pierre were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1903 for this discovery. Although this almost didn't happen. Initially, it was only going to be Pierre and Henry Baccarel who received this honor. And one of the Nobel Committee members notified Pierre of this injustice, and he petitioned the board to ensure that Mary was included on this Nobel Prize, becoming the first woman to win a Nobel Prize. Um, and actually, she would go on to win a second one in chemistry in 1911, becoming the first person to win two Nobel Prizes. And as you can see over time, radiation's use increased in the medical field with things like fractionation, various different types of tumors. By the 1950s, we started to see more modern radiation techniques with linear accelerators, which we'll talk about more later, and some of those other advancements that have occurred more recently. Uh, so a frequently asked question I get is, how does radiation work? And I'm specifically talking about photon-based radiation here. And it's a form of electromagnetic radiation, which is all around us. Microwaves, radio waves, the visible light spectrum are all photons. But the higher energy photons can be used to image and to treat tumors. And the way this works is it actually damages the DNA of the cancer cell. And because cancer cells aren't as able to repair this DNA damage, it has more of an effect on the cancer cells, something we call the therapeutic window but it does have some effect on normal tissues, and that's where the side effects come in. Uh, there are two main classes of radiation. There's external beam radiation, which is just like it sounds. It's given from the outside in, like an X-ray or a CAT scan. And there's brachytherapy, which is when the radioactive sources are actually placed into the tumor or in close proximity to the tumor. And focusing on external beam to start with, can be used in a variety of different ways to treat prostate cancer. So you can use it to cure the prostate cancer, either radiation by itself or in conjunction with hormone therapy. You can use it after surgery. If after surgery the PSA is rising or there are concerning factors at the time of surgery, you can add radiation. Increasingly, we found that it may have a role in the oligometastatic setting, and I think you've heard a lot about PSMA scans, and we'll talk a little bit about how radiation may integrate into that. And then palliatively, in events where there's pain or other types of things we may be able to help with. Um, and so the most commonly used external radiation is called intensity modulated radiation therapy, or IMRT for short. And you've heard about toxicities here, and I think one that doesn't oftentimes get as much attention is temporal toxicity. How long do these treatments take? How many times do you have to come back and forth? And one of the great advancements we've had is hypofractionation, where you can reduce the number of treatments needed to effectively treat prostate cancer and take some of that burden away from the individual as well as the family. Um, there are still cases where standard fractionation or conventionally fractionated radiation may be useful, and we'll talk about that. And there's an emerging very compacted radiation treatment called stereotactic body radiation therapy, or SBRT for short, that can be delivered in as few as five treatments over one to two weeks. I'll briefly touch on proton therapy, another area we get a lot of questions about. And treatments, just to give people an idea, do take about 30 to 45 minutes, and they are daily. So as you heard from our prior speaker, this can be a lot of burden, both financially and time-wise. So some of the advancements that have really reduced side effects, previously we lived in what was called the 2D era, and this is 
30, 40 years ago, and it's just like it sounds. You use a 2D image, an X-ray, and you took a wax pencil and you drew what you wanted to block as far as protecting tissues. They would just pour a lead block and slide that into the head of the machine. So as you can see, pretty rudimentary as far as how we could shape the radiation. One of the big advancements was the use of CT imaging to guide radiation therapy. And this was the birth of the 3D era of radiation, where you could really delineate where the prostate was, where the normal organs were, and really protect things. Another huge advancement was something called a multi-leaf collimator. And what that is, is a device that's in the head of the machine that can actually replicate the shape that you used to have to pour with those lead blocks. But what they discovered is you could use those leaves to actually dynamically shape those radiation beams as it was being delivered to the patient. And that really enabled you to hone in on the prostate and really spare the normal tissues in the area, modulating the beam. This is the birth of IMRT. And I'll show you kind of what the results of that are. Um, it is a little bit more time consuming, so there is um, some time that needs to be spent what we call contouring or segmenting the areas, which is more complicated than the old wax pencil that you saw earlier. We work closely together with a group of dosimetrists who use an algorithm to plan the radiation, and there is some quality assurance checks that need to take place before the delivery. But what that results in is, this is an example of the old 3D conformal techniques used to treat a femur. And you can see the skin reaction in the middle there mimicking the radiation field that intended to be delivered. And the reason you see that skin reaction is on the, the left or the right side of the slide up here, you can see that the radiation goes through and through. It treats all the way through on the muscle and the skin, resulting in that skin reaction. On the other side is IMRT, where treating the bone you can keep the high dose areas off of the skin and muscle, which reduces the side effects. So that's just an illustrative example of how IMRT can improve upon how we deliver. But what you saw there was a very tight field around the bone. And it's great we can do that to protect normal tissues, but if you miss, you're not helping anyone. This is a really small field you're treating, and how can you be sure you're hitting the prostate every day properly? And that's where image-guided radiation therapy comes in, or IGRT. And this is a really fancy technique where there's some imaging panels on the radiation machine. And initially, these were used just to get x-rays, but over time, they've been able to get CT scans. Some can even do MRI scans or PET scans. And this has really enabled us that accuracy, that precision to make sure we're aiming at the right place each day with the treatment. So sort of bringing that all together, usually the radiation process involves an initial consult with the radiation oncologist, oftentimes with additional studies like labs or imaging. If after discussion you decide you want to do radiation, we do that CT scan we were talking about, and that can usually be scheduled in less than a week. And then like we were saying, there is a planning process that takes about a week and a half before you can start your first treatment with a group of trained therapists. Um, and so the two types of radiation, hypofractionated and conventionally fractionated, we were talking about how usually we like to do hypofractionated. Um, there have been at least a dozen comparative studies looking at different types of shorter courses of radiation with the conventionally fractionated radiation, showing that they're equivalent as far as being able to cure someone. But the side effects can be a little different. So things like urinary difficulty, getting up a lot to go, weaker stream, can be a little more significant with the shorter courses of radiation. And that's probably a function of giving those bigger doses of radiation each day over a shorter time period. So sometimes in folks with a lot of urinary difficulties, we will recommend that longer radiation course. Now, one of the areas that's really exciting is something called stereotactic body radiotherapy. And due to a lot of those technology advancements we were talking about earlier, this has enabled us to compress that radiation treatment even further into five treatments. Now, one of the things that we're most concerned about is side effects to the rectum. And part of that is the close proximity of the rectum to the prostate. Um, and there are some studies that have suggested that especially with higher dose SBRT, there is a risk of rectal injury. 
there are, isn't the same number of studies out there comparing hypofractionated to conventionally fractionated radiation, but there's two, uh, actually a three-arm study being done in the UK right now looking at stereotactic body radiation therapy. They published the initial findings on comparing side effects, and it looks very good as far as comparing the longer courses with the shorter courses, but we're still waiting on the efficacy portion of those studies to report but certainly a promising area of being able to shrink those treatments down even further and uh, reduce the amount of time necessary for treatments. You've been hearing a lot about PMS, PSMA scans and MRIs, and many of you know MRIs sometimes are used for focal biopsies to identify more aggressive areas in the prostate. And similarly, we're trying to use this information to improve our radiation treatments. So, there was another large study done looking at something called a focal microboost. Can you treat areas that you see on MRI or PSMA scan to a higher radiation dose? And as we get better at finding on a pathology slide in pink there, it's localizing to the same area on that PSMA scan, suggesting we can identify those more aggressive lesions on these scans. Can we deliver a higher dose to these areas and improve our cure rates? And thus far, it appears that maybe we can. The data, it hasn't shown a survival benefit yet, but the early results look promising that this may be something we can do to improve our outcomes. Now, other things you may hear from your radiation oncologist or urologist are the use of fiducial markers. These are gold seeds that are put into the prostate to help with targeting. It allows you to see the prostate on an x-ray, so it's almost like a little GPS for the prostate to hone in on um, when you're treating. And there are some fancier ones that actually have RF beacons in them that you can track in real time. You may have also heard of rectal balloons. These are actually used to try and maintain the shape of the rectum in a conformal way, um, repeatably each day. The downside is they do need to be inserted every treatment. So as you can imagine, for some of these longer courses of radiation, having a rectal balloon inserted and inflated for each of these treatments um, can be a little bit of a burden on patients, but it may reduce some of the dose to the rectum. What's um, kind of developed here recently, there's been two large studies done looking at spacer gels that can be injected between the prostate and the rectum. And um, the picture with the hand shows you just an example of what this looks like uh, before it's inserted, and, and that's what it looks like. And it comes as a clear liquid that you inject between the prostate and the rectum under ultrasound guidance, and it solidifies in that space between the rectum and the prostate. And it gives you about a centimeter of space between the rectum and the prostate, pushing it away and reducing the dose to the rectum. So in the middle there, you just see the prostate on the top, that yellow structure in the middle is that gel, and on the bottom is the rectum, and the dashed line is just meant to represent the high-dose radiation, sort of showing how that gel can push it away. And so the two studies that have been done have shown a reduction in rectal side effects in conventionally fractionated radiation, and in recent study that just came out showed it appears to be effective in hypofractionated radiation as well. And we're hoping, particularly with stereotactic body radiation, that those results hold true for that as well. Adaptive radiotherapy is fairly new, um, and what this enables you to do is replan the radiation while the person is actually on the radiation machine. And as you may recall, I just told you, it took something like three to five days to plan radiation. So these new uh, machines basically leverage a lot of technology to try and make the planning process faster, sometimes using things like artificial intelligence and things to accelerate the contouring and planning process. And what this lets you do is, on this picture I'm just showing the bladder changing in size during the radiation treatment, you're able to address these changes in anatomy on the radiation table and change the radiation treatment as you're going. And so the hope is this will really reduce side effects even further by being able to do this adaptive therapy. And there are several studies ongoing looking at this as well. I think um, we get a lot of questions about proton therapy. So this is an entirely different particle. We talked about photon therapy being electromagnetic radiation. 
This, as you may recall, nucleuses of atoms are made up of protons and neutrons, and this is literally using one of those protons um, as the particle for the treatment. And the advantage of protons is they still have entrance dose, meaning there's some radiation dose that is delivered as it's going into the tissue. But once it gets to a certain depth, it releases a large amount of energy. And by doing so, in this picture, basically what I'm showing you is on the top is your more typical IMRT plan, and on the bottom is proton plan. That low dose cloud that's kind of covering the whole body is not there with the proton plan. There's less low dose going around. It's not, they haven't done the large comparative studies yet, um, randomizing protons and photons, although there are a number that are open right now that are accruing. Um, thus far, with the retrospective studies that have been done, it's not clear that there's a reduction in side effects and efficacy looks equivalent. So right now, um, the AUA, the big urologic association, and ASTRO, the big radiation oncology um, society, recommend Proton therapy can be used in prostate cancer, but it's not yet clear that there's any difference in toxicity or efficacy, although you can see that it's a grade C recommendation, meaning that we still need more data in this realm. So most of what I've talked about to this point has been in the definitive setting using external beam radiation, but there's also that setting of salvage radiation we talked about after surgery. And this can be done if the PSA doesn't go to zero after surgery or if it starts rising at a later point. Sometimes if we th see things concerning enough at the time of surgery, we'll want to recommend radiation. And because essentially when they took the prostate out, the rectum and the bladder kind of fell into that area where the prostate used to be, we usually try and give the radiation slower, although there are some places that are looking at this hypofractionated radiation, and there's some promising data there that we may be able to do that safely so that even in men who um, have had surgery, we can accelerate the treatments. Now, this is an area I think we're really excited about. So I think you've heard about some of the ways PSMA has enabled us to better identify disease and better treat disease. And so here, where radiation can sometimes fall, um, as one of the preferred options is when we're in the oligometastatic setting. So if there's only something like four to five lesions identified in lymph nodes or bones, there are some studies that have suggested that by doing radiation to these limited areas that we may be able to either push off progression of the disease or maybe in certain settings even cure disease. And so this is something that's been actively investigated and really has been enabled by this new PSMA scan and being better able to diagnose this oligometastatic setting. External beam side effects, so because of the proximity of the prostate to the bladder and rectum, uh, oftentimes there can be alterations in bowel movements, so having loose stools or diarrhea sometimes some urinary changes like more frequent or urgent urination or burning, and fatigue can occur during the treatment. Late side effects refer to those that can occur months to years down the road. So things like erectile dysfunction can occur a few years down the road. Rectal bleeding, similar to hemorrhoids, so uh, usually a small amount of bleeding that can be treated with cautery. Sometimes you can get some scarring in the urethra that will lead to weaker stream and small risk of bone weakening in the hips. Secondary cancers are a small risk as well um, due to the radiation itself. This isn't a recurrence of the prostate cancer, but could be an entirely different cancer in the area like rectal or bladder. Um, and so prep preparing for the radiation, a lot of this is trying to keep that internal anatomy consistent. And so, especially if it's not adaptive radiotherapy, we want people to have a comfortably full bladder and to try and empty their bowels before their treatment just to keep the prostate as much in the same position internally as possible. We certainly can make adjustments for that, but it helps with consistency. Some of the things you can do to help with the diarrhea and urinary changes are reducing caffeine or dairy intake. Sometimes if you're eating a very high fiber diet, cutting back on that a little bit can help with the diarrhea. And then alcohol and caffeine can sometimes worsen urinary frequency. Occasionally, we'll need to prescribe medications for this. Um, so there are some prescription medications that can usually handle 
the, the diarrhea and urinary frequency and get those to calm down. Now, the other broad category I was talking about is brachytherapy. So this can be further subdivided into two different categories, low-dose rate and high-dose rate brachytherapy. And brachytherapy uses needles to deliver the radiation to the prostate, so it's not a full-blown surgical procedure. And with low-dose rate, that's what this picture shows here, you actually put radioactive sources into the prostate that stay there permanently. With high dose rate brachytherapy, catheters or tubes are inserted and a high energy radiation source is used to treat the prostate. And so to give you an idea of how these procedures are performed, so as I said earlier, low dose rate radiation is usually um, done with um, these seeds and they can come in different kinds. There's iodine, there's palladium, um, but there's a different couple of different isotopes you can use. And to give you a sense of scale on the size of those seeds, there's a penny and, and some of those seeds there, you can see they're really small. We usually use these in men with lower or low intermediate risk prostate cancer as monotherapy, meaning just the brachytherapy by itself. Although there have been studies that show a combination of the brachytherapy with external beam radiation may be effective in treating men with higher risk disease and may have some benefits. Um, and that bottom picture just shows uh, typically how we do it. So the person is in stirrups asleep. We use a template for the needles to guide it into the prostate. And then we use these hollow needles to put the seeds into the prostate. And this can be done either in the operating room where you do the plan with a group of physicists in the operating room, or the needles can be preloaded with a planned distribution of seeds and you can put those in at the time of the procedure. There are radiation safety requirements needed for this. So the seeds you can think of almost like a battery. They have this radiation charge in them and over time that charge goes away. So in the case of iodine, after about a year, the charge goes away entirely and those seeds are inert. But in that early period, we want you to limit contact with pregnant women, little kids, because growing, uh, when kids are in that growth phase, radiation can affect them more. High dose rate involves putting hollow catheters into the prostate and a machine like the one pictured there is hooked up to those catheters and it has a really high um, activity source soldered to the end of a wire that moves out in a very specific pattern into these catheters. And it gives you really, really good control of the radiation dose. The downside is that sometimes you have to repeat these procedures numerous times. So sometimes you do have to put the catheters in multiple times as opposed to LDR where it's a one-time procedure. Um, the good part is you don't need those precautionary uh, measures because the radiation source, once you're done, is outside of you and you don't need to take those precautions because you're no longer radioactive. And so talking about the dose, going back to the prior slide discussing IMRT versus protons, you can see examples there. The great part about LDR and HDR, while it does require a procedure and has some of those other factors, you don't even have that entrance dose we talked about with proton therapy. So you can see here um, on the uh, left, or the right, oh, I'm sorry, the left of the slide up here, you can see an example of LDR and HDR, the dose cloud around there. And you can see how tightly packed it is around the prostate as opposed to the protons and IMRT where there's some more dose fill. And as you can imagine, you put something like 15 to 20 needles into the prostate, you can cause some swelling and bleeding. And so some men will have some obstructive symptoms like weaker stream. Probably about one in 20 will need a catheter to stay in for a few days to a week after the procedure to let that swelling come down. Small risk of rectal bleeding like with the external beam. With the LDR, there can be seed migration where men can urinate out the seed or something like that, but that's not common erectile dysfunction over time, and secondary cancer is similar to the external beam that we discussed earlier. Um, and then specific, specifically for the LDR, we talked about the radio, radiation uh, precautions, um, so avoiding contact with pregnant women and little kids, 
rarely there are some sensitive detectors at airports and things that can be set off. Um, and so most radiation facilities will give you documentation so you can show it to security, letting them know uh, that this is medically related. And so just walking you through the process for LDR, usually it requires a pre-procedure with a CAT scan or an ultrasound to know how many seeds to order and plan the radiation. It is done under anesthesia typically, and um, usually we do a follow-up about 30 days afterwards. Some places will do it right after the procedure to confirm the seed placement. Sometimes you'll need to put in a few more seeds at the end of the procedure, in a second procedure, if they've migrated. Um, and with that, I was going to take any questions about the different modalities of radiation or side effects you might have. Well, uh, thank you all for your attention and uh, appreciate you inviting me out.